Okay, uh, let's go ahead and start today. Um, I must say I had a Zoom disaster in the first class. Um, appears to be working better now. I hope, uh, I hope it continues to. Uh, I thought that I would throw up my solutions to these homeworks briefly. And of course, this is getting recorded, so, <laughs> you know, if you, if you have a mind to, you can uh, look at it further on the recording, but, whoops, that one went again. A little bigger. It's got a hair trigger. All right, so on the first one, um, I've just listed the information given. I think in the problem statement, that should be pretty straightforward. I guess what, I guess I did not put lagging by this KVAR, I think we mentioned it in class, but that should be taken as a uh, uh, lagging um, situation. And I didn't give you a leading, okay? So if you go through that, uh, that rate structure, you'll see we have fixed fees, customer and admin fee, total uh, 2350. And then we get down to actually uh, calculating the bill. The on-peak demand is $10.87, I believe. Um, there's another rate out there, I think a GSA rate, it's 1024. I don't really care, I mean, it's pretty much the same. I can change the numbers here pretty easy to, uh, to recalculate, but uh, I think the one I intended you to use was this one, but you know, who knows. Um, so 1087 times this on peak KW gets you 99,743. Pretty straightforward. Then for the maximum demand, you, you have an on peak and an off peak. So you just select the larger of those, which pretty obviously is the off peak and you get charged another $5.38 for your max demand. So 538 times the 10,350, 55,683, add those together. So for this month, the total demand charge is 155,426. Okay, on the energy, <clears throat> on peak is really straightforward. It's, this is the rate, uh, 7.843 cents per kilowatt hour. And on peak energy is that many kilowatt hours. Multiply them together and you get a number like 98,744, okay? Uh, off peak, a little more complicated. So these are the hours that you use to calculate the block size. So what the equation says is take the on-peak demand, which is 9176 times 200, so that's kilowatts times hours is kilowatt hours. And I don't know why they do this, but they say they'd multiply it by the ratio of the off-peak energy divided by the total energy. So off-peak is this, and total is the sum of those. And that's uh, what, 4,602,800. You can read it right down here for the sum. So if you do that math, you know, on peak demand times this times that ratio, you get a million 333. So that first block is a million 333 kilowatt hours. And you get to pay them 5.352 cents per kilowatt hour. So that racks up another 71,353, okay? Now, at that point, you've paid for this many, but you owe for this many, so guess what? You're not done. You got some more paying to do, okay? Well, the math on the block size calculation is the same. You just have to make sure that you don't calculate that you're paying for more than you used. But if you add these two together, you see that's uh, 2,666,000 and you got to pay for 3.3 million. So you're going to saturate that second block. So you've got to pay for all of those, okay? 
So it's the same KWH because it's the same math, but this time it's only 1.894 cents. So they're getting cheaper. So this drops from uh, 71,000 to 25,251. And so now you've paid for this plus this. And so if you take that amount and subtract it off of this, that's what you have left to pay for. And that comes up to be 677,359 kilowatt hours. And that rate is even a little bit better. That's 1.553 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's another 10,500. Total all of those, and you should get 205,868. Okay, so that's probably the hardest part of this is getting those blocks right. I don't know. A couple other things you gotta be careful of. Questions? Where does that come from? Yeah, we have, um, did you subtract this off? Or this off no, okay, okay, okay. If you look, okay, let's look in the right structure. Uh, let's see. Power rates. Uh, LMS, I think that's the one. I'm doing what it says. Uh, I'm sorry. Winner, hold on. Where am I? I'm trying. <laughs> if I find the right thing. Okay. Right here. So to calculate the kilowatt hours per month, 200 hours metered on peak demand multiplied by the ratio of the off peak energy to total energy. I'm doing that calculation. So numerically, and if you got a calculator, you can check it, but I'm, that's the nice thing about Excel. If you get it programmed right, you're gonna get the right answer. You know? So, and I'll show you in the cell. So if you look at this, I'm taking F26, which is 200, multiplying it by I7, I7 should be this, that's the on-peak demand, multiplying it by the ratio of I10. I10 is the off-peak energy, and then the divi I'm dividing by the sum of these two. So that's total energy. So that's exactly, and so that comes up, and so that number is kilowatt hours. And so that's the total block size. Now, if you didn't use in your off-peak energy, if you if, say if you only used a million, then you'd only have to pay for a million there. But the block size is a million three hundred thirty-three thousand two two hundred fourteen. So if you use three point three million, you got to pay for all of these at this higher rate. And then you get, and then you've still got some left over that you have to pay for. So then you go down to block two. And the block size calculation is exactly the same when you look at the rate. Uh, let's see, block two per month for the next 200 hours. So it's 200 times the metered on peak demand times the ratio of the off peak energy to the total energy. Well, it's the same math. It's exactly the same. So you go back and you look at it. So when I, you know, I did the math, but I mean, you know, you know what is gonna come out. You just gotta make sure that you're not paying for more than you used. But guess what? When I add these two together, I get 2.67 million. Well, when I go up here and look, I used 3.3 million. So guess what? I've saturated the second block. I've used all of them in the second block. So that's times 1.894. So that's another 25K, 
You know, utilities liking this game. I'm not liking it very much if I got to write the check, but this is the way it works. Then I can add these two together and basically I'm going to pay for the rest of them in block three, unless I saturate this block. And if you look at the math, it's pretty, it's pretty hard to saturate this one because this one is 400 hours. So 400 hours would get me the sum of those first two blocks because they're 200 each. And so I didn't use nearly that much. So then what I have to do is I have to add up these two and subtract that from this. And I got to pay, and that comes up 677,000. And I get to pay for those at 1.553 cents per kilowatt hour. You know, you, you really have a hard time understanding this until you jump in. It's like, it's like learning to swim. You can hear me tell you of what it's like to swim all day long, but until you get a couple mouthfuls of water, you're, not, you're just not gonna get it. You know, it's just not gonna really sink in. And so once you get into Excel and you go through this and you see what it takes to get the numbers correct, then, then you start understanding. Okay, are we good? Everybody good? All right. Okay, so on to reactive demand charge. Okay, so well, we can, let's go look. I try to stay away from this, reading this thing as much as I can, because this thing, will, uh, reactive demand charge. Okay, basically what it's gonna say is you're gonna take your maximum demand for the month. Now, it's a 30-minute average. Okay, we get it. But it's basically, you know, it's at 10,350 kW because that's your max demand for the month. Okay? And you're going to multiply that by 0.33. And what that, what that 0.33, that, that, and then that's going to calculate a KVAR. And that KVAR represents a 95% power factor in the power triangle. So for your max demand at 95% power factor, you will have that 33.33 times that. And where is that? So there's 33% of max meter demand. So that's 30, 34.15.5. That's what they will allow you. They give you that much. On a, on a lagging power factor, they will give you down to point to 95% power factor. If your KVAR is any more than that, you have to pay for it, okay? So that 0.33, if you go back to that power triangle, we did that last time by assuming 1,000 and doing that. But that's what you come up with. If the power factor is 95%, that KVAR will be 0.33 times the KW. That's just the way the trig and the math works out. They're trying to make it simple for somebody that doesn't know anything about Pythagoras or trigonometry, or they forgot it all, whatever. Okay, so that's what's allowable. So then you look at the bill and you go, oh crap, my KVAR was 93.23. Well, okay, so if that's what yours was, they're gonna give you this much, so you have to pay for the difference. So we're gonna take, we're just gonna do the subtraction and we get 5907.5 that we have to pay for. And if it's lagging, it's a buck 46 per K bar. So that's gonna cost you $8,624.95. And that's your penalty. That's your power factor penalty. Now, let's see, I don't know that, we never did really calculate power factor on this. Well, let me see, do I do that down here? Yeah, I guess I did, I don't know. I can't remember. Yeah, there it is. Say the power factor stinks. Is that right? KVAR at my, oh, now the, uh, I'm not sure, is this right? Maximum, nah, this is, these are numbers from the year before. I haven't changed these numbers yet, sorry. I changed this, this is right. This stuff, I mean, we can change it here uh, real quick. Uh, let me see, this is, uh, 9176. No, it's 10. 
got to get it. It's 10, 350. 10, ah, hard to operate up here. 10, 350. 10, 350 and the KVAR uh, 9323. There. There you go. So that power factor is 74. And I made it up to be bad, you know, just. It would be of interest. It's no fun if the if the penalty is like a hundred dollars. You know what? What fun is that? You know, you might as well calculate a big one. The math is the same. Okay. So that's reactive. Okay. So is there, are there questions on that on the reactive charge? Dr. Cunningham. Yes. Uh, this is about the demand charge, but how come the twelve month uh, maximum demand wasn't used uh, because you, you weren't given a 12 month maximum demand. Okay. So I guess that the, makes sense. The only demand you have is 10, the highest demand you have is 10, 350. Okay. I might be thinking of the, you're second thinking of the facility here. charge. Well, are you, you may have been thinking, I don't know, the, maybe the power factor. I don't know. But I think in this one, uh, I, I, I don't think it wouldn't come into play here anyway, I don't think. But, oh, okay. No, I, well, okay, I guess I did. I take it back. But uh, it doesn't come into play here. If you look in the right, I believe, does it say anything about reactive demand charge? Uh, uh, by which by any reactive demand exceeds 33%. If reactive demand requires 25% excluding the demand. I, I, unless I'm just skipping over it, I don't, I don't see where that would come into play in the reactive demand charge. Yeah, I, I was talking about the the actual demand charge, the the first one you calculated. I'm a little late asking, but. Uh, termination statement, uh, determination on peak hours. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's the fourth paragraph down is the fourth one paragraph. I was okay. Yeah, the on peak uh, demand shall in no case be less than the sum of thirty percent of the first and forty percent of the next and fifty. Well. Well, but see, th this is for a minimum bill. Calculation. So I mean, third. So under, under Part One, you've got like ten thousand. So you would take thirty percent and forty percent. Okay. Ten three fifty times point three is thirty one oh five. Store one, and then you've got ten three fifty minus five one two three equals that times 0. 0.4 is 2140 plus recall one equals it. So that comes out like, I don't know, less than 5,500 out of, out of one. Okay, so one, yeah. one is not gonna do it. Uh, the, the bottom line of that paragraph there, it says, or the highest on peak billing demand established during the preceding 12 months. Uh, and 85% of all KW, 85% of all KW in excess of 350 KW of the higher of the currently effective demand contract are the highest on peak billing demand established. Hmm. 
Well, you may have a point. I may have, I may have read over that. So, let, I, I mean, that, that could well be true. That's one reason we're going over this. But, I, I mean, the, 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 the utility company will implement this. Yeah, they've got this program to the letter of the law. And if that's in there and I have missed it, then kudos to you. Um, I want to read over it in the quiet of my office. I don't, I, got you. I don't want to spend the whole class just on this today. I got you. But, I mean, you know, whatever it says in this, right, is what you're supposed to do. And, All righty. And if that got passed over by me, then so be it. Okay? Thank you. All right. Good question. Okay. Uh, so, so we all have to go back and check. <laughs> oh me! I knew I shouldn't have shown you my spreadsheet yet. <laughs> See, it's always dangerous until until you get them all in. Somebody will catch this stuff. That's pretty good. All right. Uh, yeah, he said. I think it was on peak demand. I'm not sure if that's right or not, because you've got to read all the way through there and make sure that it applies. So let's move on for right now. Um, facility charge, I had a mistake in this as well. Uh, facility charge. There you go. I'm pretty sure I got this one right now because we said they're taking they're taking power at like twelve thousand or something. It's fairly low, so they're going to pay on the first. Uh, they're going to pay ninety three cents per kW, and this is on contract demand. So this is thirteen thousand. So it'll be ten thousand times uh, 0 0.93 plus three thousand times point seventy three, and that's their facility charge. And so that comes to 11,490 subtotal and tax, with the possibility that uh, I may have to, we may have to make adjustments based on on that last clause. Uh, we'll have to look into that and see. Talk to you more about that next time. Okay, so on the the power factor homework, we're given. Uh, Real KW on peak and off peak. Maximum demand, just select the highest. Apparent power, so we're, we're, this is a calculation of the KVA. Well, if this is the power factor, I can take, and this is on peak, so I can simply take uh, Q5 divided by this as a decimal, and that'll get me the hypotenuse of the power triangle. And so for the off peak, it's almost the same power factor changed by a tenth, but so the math is very similar, a little bit higher. So that's the uh, hypotenuse of the power triangle for the off peak. And then reactive, this is just uh, programming Pythagoras' theorem. This one squared this squared minus this squared square root should be this one and uh, this one squared minus this one squared square root should be this one. Okay. Uh, this is just converting uh, from the power factor. So in the decimal form, this is the cosine, right? So you just have to take the arc you have to take the arc cosine, and in Excel, it comes up in radians, and then you gotta multiply by 180 divided by pi to get degrees. So it's about 26 degrees. Uh, cost of power, the, the allowable KVAR, that's that 0.33 times, so um, let's see, times uh, Q8, that should be the max. Q8 right there, that's the maximum. So that's the allowable. The metered was that. The difference is the amount I exceeded the allowable. 
And so the penalty is that times it's a buck 46 is this. And then in this case, uh, you did have a uh, leading K var, and you don't get any credit on the leading K var. You have to pay for all of them. It was 617, and that's times a buck 14. And so that's 703. So then I'd, I say, if, you know, and you can round this off. You know, if you corrected it perfectly, you would, you would add this amount of capacitors to set it at nine five, so you might want to round that to 2,600, I don't care, whatever. But it, 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 in this month, if you had 2,576, you would have just negated the penalty, KVAR, and you would have been back up to the allowable, as this, this minus this is this. So if I add that much capacitance, it's gonna take me right up to there, and that's allowable, and so there's no penalty. Okay, uh, so in that month, that's what I needed. So monthly savings is just the sum of this plus this, assuming that this corrected the leading and lagging. So there could be some interpretation in that. Would you get them both corrected? I would hope so, but you know, that would be a question for the electrical designer, really. But if you did, you'd say 44.68 at 80 bucks a KVAR. Just uh, if you put in this number of KVAR times 80, $206,000. If all months were like this, 12 times this is about 53.6. So I'm showing about a 3.8 year payback. So someplace around four years to get your money back. I have a couple of questions about this. Oh God. <laughs> um, first, so we're saying that the power that was given to us in the email uh, with the Microsoft Word document, um, the total up. consumption, the one, 1. 1.7 million, we're saying that's real power, not, uh, that's not, um, that's not, power. that's energy. 1.7, 1, 1. this number right here? Yes. Wow, uh, kilowatt hours. I got you on this one. You got me. I got you, bingo, thank heavens. I got, I got to get one right every once in a while, they'll fire me. <laughs> <laughs> now that, okay, okay, you see, that's good. That's, what, that's why I want you in this stuff. Because KWH is energy, KW is demand. And this KVAR stuff and all that relates to the demand, the peak. And the power triangle is not energy, it's KW, KVA, and KVAR, which is all instantaneous stuff. It's not energy. Okay. Okay, louder, just yell it. Uh, okay, so the meter that comes in the building, it primarily records KW. It also is, is recording the current and the voltage and this other stuff. But the power measurement and the energy measurement is KW. But what happens is when you run low power factor, the amount of current that you have to supply for the given power level goes up, the current goes up. The power is the same, and if you start reducing power factor, the current goes up, but the power is the same. Well, when the, when the utility company sells you that power, an extra 50, we did that example, it was, I don't know, 50 or 60, or it was 152 amps or something. It was some large number of amps because the power factor was low. That's, that's current they can't sell to your neighbor that would, re, that would be recorded as KW on his meter because if they don't have this additional mechanism, they just lose rev, revenue. So see, that's why they're, they're willing to, they'll give you a 0.95, some rate structures will give you 0.85, but when you go below that, they're saying enough, enough. 
you're taking because you're taking money out of their pocket. If you ran a 50% power factor, your current draw would be so large and they wouldn't get any more money out of it if they're just measuring KW. So they have to have another mechanism. And this KVAR and all this stuff is how they get this additional revenue. Is that, is that good? When I say what? Apparent power is KVA, correct? Say what? I'm sorry. Apparent power? Oh, apparent power. That's KVA. That's correct. That's volts times amps times the square root of three. But, so I guess I'm still not totally understanding how that relates to real power. Oh, well, okay. The, the, the KVA is the hypotenuse of the triangle. The KW is that sine side. So... KVAR KVA. So see, this is what you're pulling, but this is what the meter's reading. Uh, th that's what their that's what their base charge is on, demand and kilowatt hours. Because this is KV. A times power factor, right? Well, so, you know, they may be supplying a thousand amps here, but because the power factor is 0.5, the KW is low for a thousand amps. So they're giving you all this current and they're not getting much money back for it. I can't hear you. You got to. Okay, all right. So it says on the farm track B, this is 1750, 1750, 1750, 1750, 1750, 1750, 1750, 1750, 1750, monthly usage unless you exceed it if you exceed it they'll penalize you metered peak okay that that's your peak that's your on peak peak 15,854 see that's a decimal point those are commas it's a little hard to read see these two are commas this kwh that's a decimal point. Well, you see, but, 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 but you don't see the current. But I mean, what you care about is the power factor over here. See, this power factor, if it's supposed to be 95% and they're running 89.7, they're pulling excess current because their power factor is low and the utility is going to penalize them for it. Okay? I'd get, come by the office if you want to talk more about it. Okay? All right. I think, did we get through? God, I hope so. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, this is just wonderful. Yes, ma'am, you keep asking them questions. I, I'm going to come over here so I can hear you. Uh, okay, so from the lighting, you do you find your allowable by the point three three by what was metered max, and then you subtract. So how do you know? So the leading it just tells you on your bill, right? So uh, it, it'll tell you on the bill if okay. it's leading or lagging. Okay. I, I should have told you in the homework, right. but it's lagging. Okay. Okay. Yes, so your allowable is keyed off of your KW because they have just solved that power triangle for 95%. So they know the ratio. It doesn't matter if this is 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000, the ratio is still the same. It's just, am I going to draw it this far down or am I going to draw it all the way out here and down that much further? But the ratio between, you know, that 0.33 times that KW line is what's allowable over here in terms of K bar. 
And if you go longer than that, you're going to pay for the pay for the privilege. Okay. Woo, doggy. I need a I need a talk. Never mind. <laughs> I need a tall cold one's what I need. Okay. But let's get on to our, really our topic for the day. And you do have your STEAM Fundamentals reading quiz on Tuesday. So I will give you, I think it's 25 questions. You'll have about 30 minutes. I mean, that's just select the answer. So we'll do it. I mean, you, you need to have a computer or something so that you can get to iLearn. It's on iLearn. So we'll all log in. It's, I'll, it'll be turned on for 30 minutes to start a class. What are we, noon till 12.30 on Tuesday. Everybody will be taking that quiz, I hope. <laughs> so for those of us who are Zooming in, we can take the quiz uh, at, in, uh, at home. We don't have to come in to take this That's quiz. That's correct. You can awesome. take it at home. Thank you so much. Yep. And so I guess we're going to make this open document because if people are at home, <laughs> I mean, I don't, you know, what am I going to do? <laughs> There's not much I can do. So. Just what I told you to read. I think it's what, 20 something pages. It's not all that bad. Okay, so this is where we uh, left off last time. And this was the STEAM system scoping tool, which I did email out to you, so you have your own copy of it. If you ever want to go in a STEAM plant and interrogate them, you have a whole list of questions. that You can say, well, how often do you measure boiler efficiency? Huh? Huh? Go, go down to the tech STEAM plant. should send you down there. You walk in, we're a, we're a concerned student group researching how much you're damaging our environment. So sit down, we want you to answer these questions. So you could, you could go right down this list and nail them, nail them to the wall. Actually, they're pretty good. Randy and uh, Andy Loftus and the guys that run that place are pretty good. Uh, so I think we went through um, some of this, the efficiency, uh, boiler heat recovery equipment, do you have what we call a stack economizer, which is just a heat exchanger that sits in the stack to put the feed water through to preheat it before you put it in the boiler? I mean, that's heat you're gonna throw away up the stack. Why don't we suck some energy out of it and put it back in the boiler so we can reduce the fuel usage? That's one, that's the most common type of heat recovery equipment, but there's some others that we'll go through in detail. Uh, boiler uh, steam quality. Are we putting out a lot of moisture droplets in the steam? You know, a saturated boiler putting out saturated steam, but you know, is the velocity too high? Um, we have too much water in the boiler. Is there something going on that we're blowing excess moisture with the steam out in the piping system, which can cause water hammer, which can cause excess corrosion, etc. Not good. So do you check your steam quality very often? That's not the easiest thing in the world to do, by the way. Um, automatic boiler blowdown control. Blowdown, we blow out of the boiler to, to keep the impurity levels in the boiler water at the proper level. Well, how do you control that? Simple boiler systems, they go over there and old Pete, the boiler operator, walks up to the valve, makes the valve, cranks that thing open. He's got 300 pounds of pressure behind it. He's blowing water down the sewer and he goes one, two, three, four, five. Closes the valve. Took care of that for this shift. Writes it on his little log sheet and goes, sits back, goes to sleep again in the room. Well, that's one way to do it. Now, if you do that and you plot the, the level of crud in the boiler water, what you see is it builds up and old Pete blows it down, then it goes down here, and then it builds up again, and then Jim comes in on the next shift, and he blows it down, and it goes down here. Well, 
you're going to blow away more water and energy than if you had an automatic controller that had a valve that just sit there, rocked it back and forth, and just kept it right at whatever level you wanted. Automatic boiler blowdown control. Do you have it? I don't think they have. I, do they? I, have, I don't think tech has. I, I, I have made suggestions to them on their blowdown system, and we'll, we'll talk more about that as we get through this stuff. Um, frequency of high, low pressure alarms, just to get some kind of an idea. Do we have a high pressure, low pressure incidents? How well are the controls working? Frequency of boiler pressure, steam fluctuations, similar situation. Okay, uh, steam distribution in use, recovery, operating practices. Uh, minimize steam flows through PRVs. There, we mentioned that in our little diagram, that pressure reducing valve takes steam from a high pressure to a low pressure. We don't wanna do a lot of that, we wanna put it through a turbine. And when I put it through a turbine, I get something out of it. When I put it through a PRV, I get exergy destruction, which, you know, is a, dirty, is a dirty word to a thermodynamicist, you know? You don't wanna do that. You're giving up the ability to do useful work, so we would like to minimize that if possible. Now, if the system's real small and you don't have any turbines, but you know, even Tennessee Tech uh, has a little Copus uh, single-stage turbines over there for their boiler feed pumps. They don't run electric pumps over there on the boiler feed. They've got a couple of little uh, steam dirt, steam, uh, driven pumps that they just run it off of the, the boiler pressure, say 100, 100 pounds is enough to, to run that little turbine and that's how they move the feed water around and they don't have to run, they have an electric for backup and that saves them money because natural gas is far cheaper than electricity, you know, on, a, on an equal footing. So that's a, that's, what, that's a good thing. They've had those turbines over there forever and they, they really work well. Uh, uh, options for reducing steam pressure. I, actually, Tennessee Tech does that. I mean, you know, if it's a saturated boiler and you reduce the pressure, what happens to the temperature? It goes down, right? Look in the steam tables. If I go from 200 pounds to 180 pounds, my, my temperature comes down, okay? So Tennessee Tech in the summertime when they're not heating or anything, not big, low, not big loads, they may be doing some cooking over there, that's one issue. They'll bring that steam pressure down to maybe 90, 85, 90, and maybe 100, 110 in the winter because they need the temperature, they need, they, they need the extra flow, more pressure you can, uh, cram more flow, the, sp the volume goes down a little bit, you get more mass through, so you, you, you can uh, heat a little bit better. They have been doing that. Now, with these new buildings online, I'm not sure that may, there are a lot of things changing in the tech system with these, with the new fitness center and this life sciences building. Those are huge, huge loads being put on all the equipment. Uh, recovering and utilizing available condensate. We send that steam out, we condense it in a heat exchanger. What do we do with the condensate? Do we throw it on the ground, which some people do? Do we put it in the sewer or do we get it back? Or if we can't get it back, do, do we try to pull the energy out of it because it's hot water? It could be 300 degree water. Am I just gonna throw that on the ground? Oh my God, <laughs> it's a big one, you know? Um, and recovering and utilizing available flash steam. And so flash steam, now you have an idea what that's about. Okay, so anyway, all you, you give yourself scores based on however points the category is and it adds it up and it gives you, the so possible score is 340. Uh, this guy filled this out, you know, gave him 222 points. He made 65% on the, SSST scorecard. Well, what's that mean? I mean, it's really kind of meaningless, but the value of it is in asking all of those questions. And you gotta say something about, well, what about boiler blowdown heat recovery? Oh, crap, never thought about that. Well, there you go, there's systems out there that would allow you to recover some energy, be a little more efficient. 
reduce operating costs. So anyway, that's what this is about. Uh, general tools, you know, all your engineering fundamentals, and some software. Let me uh, let me show you this measure program. About time that you guys and gals download. I just want to get out of electric rates. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever had so much fun at electric rates. You got you guys asked too many questions. Oh, keep an old guy. Okay, so this is the icon. And if you just Google US DOE M E A S U R. Yes, Oak Ridge doesn't know how to spell measure. <laughs> That's how they spell it. This will download to your computer. Click this thing. And it's firing up. Now, Oak Ridge is constantly making improvements to this. They've got a lot of stuff in here. We have consulted some with Oak Ridge. I know the people over there, so I've used some of this stuff. I do some training for them. And I've complained at them, why, well, no, I won't do this, I won't do this. I've got a couple of complaints on the table with them right now, and they go, well, that's not an easy change. We'll, we'll, we'll worry about that later, and I can show you some of this stuff. Uh, if you see this little thing, they've got another new version out there, and no, I'm not going to try to download that right now. About half the time when you do this, the download bombs, and you got to do it more than once. And I've had enough computer failures today. I, I think I'm just going to ride through with what I got on here. So what this thing does is the main large simulation packages are a pump uh, system, process heating software, fan assessments, I've not played with the fan assessment much, steam, and this, this is software to help you do a, an energy treasure hunt. That's a, like an, you do a, 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 a typically a three day, you go into a plant, get with the staff guys, and you just go out in teams, just looking for stuff. And this is some software that will help you write up the ideas and it'll quantify them. It's Excel sheets and it, it's got a roll up tool that, adds everything together but so we're, we're not really interested I mean you're welcome to play around with anything but so what, what I am interested though is in the steam system assessment uh, let's see so red wing this is one that I, I did with this is an Archer Daniel Midland plant we did this pretty recently so this is one um, that's already filled up but it's really pretty easy. You start up here at the top and you know, system set up. So you go through this, so you hit this and then you go through all of these headings and then you go on to assessment uh, and then you can, you can ask it to evaluate different uh, projects. And it's, it's pretty, pretty nice software. So, you know, on the, the settings, you can use different currencies, you know, do you want a dollar or, well, I guess you can use the dollar right now. You can set your units. Do you want that nasty SI and metric stuff? No, nah, nah, you don't want that. Surely you don't, I don't. <laughs> you can use whatever you want. Uh, Imperial is what I usually use. Uh, custom, I guess you can select your particular units. And then it'll show you, like when I click Imperial, it's, uh, but I can, I can use any of these units that I want. So I can, I can customize this. Degrees Fahrenheit, Kelvin, Rankin, Celsius, whatever. So this is just setting um, units. Operations. Uh, how many hours per year do they operate this guy? You know, they're, they're usually down some for maintenance, you know, so. This plant estimated 8,000 hours a year. So down seven, so 80, so 760 hours down for maintenance or whatever. Uh, site import power, that's the average KW. 
man, you guys are experts on that now. There's no power factor in here. I want you to know, no power factor, no K bars, just, just a little good KW, you know, the real McCoy. So what this thing is gonna do is it's gonna rough out an electrical cost, which is KW times hours. And then you're gonna tell it how much electricity is worth and it's gonna multiply it and it's gonna say my basic plant electrical cost is that. KW times hours times cost, pretty simple. Make up water temperature. When make up water actually gets into the steam system, what temperature is it? Not necessarily what it comes out of the ground, because it come, if it comes out of the ground and it goes through three stages of treatment, you know, and it may pick up, it may be in the boiler house where it's hot, it may pick up 10 or 15 or 20 degrees while it's in there before it actually goes into the steam system. Because we're interested thermodynamically and, you know, how cold is that water when our steam system gets it? Fuel costs, dollars per million BTUs, 320. Electricity, 8.74 cents per kilowatt hour and make up water cost. So, you know, when I throw a gallon of water, which that's, yeah, that's dollars per gallon. For every dollar, um, for every gallon of water I put down the sewer, what's the water make up water cost gonna be for me? Okay. Boiler. So, you know, you're gonna realize pretty quick that this thing is not all that hard to run. Okay. And you can get some pretty good numbers out of it. Boiler details, well, gosh, what kind of fuel am I putting in? Gas, and then you could define different gaseous fuels, or do I have coal or wood or whatever? Gas, and then, okay, it's gas. So then I've got three potential gas fuels, and you can, uh, you can add your own fuels, too, if you want to. Uh, coke oven gas, have I ever been to a, a steel, big steel mill? You know what a coke oven is? That's where they take the, they take coal and they make coke. Coke is a blast furnace gas fuel. It's coal that's been cooked at pretty high temperature. And it, uh, when you do that, it drives off volatile gases called coke oven gases. And they take those gases and they burn them in the blast furnace. And then they put the, they have to use coke instead of coal because the coke it is pretty strong, it, it, it can hold weight, and so it gets loaded in there and then there's some of the charges on top of it. If they put regular coal, the coal, when it burns, it'll collapse and everything just kind of falls down in a big heap. And so they put the coke in there and it has the structural characteristics and it still burns um, as, a, as a fuel. So anyway, and then there's blast furnace gas the blast furnaces give off um, a gas that has, has some heating value. The coke oven gas is about four or 500 BTU, something like that, four or 500 BTUs uh, per cubic foot, I guess. And then the, that's the coke oven gas. The blast furnace gas is about 100. It's not very good. But so what they do at the big steel mills is they take, the coke oven gas, the blast furnace gas, and then depending on the BTU content, they blend some natural gas in there with it just to get it up to the point that it will satisfy their needs. So they, do, they have these gas blending stations where, where you put all that stuff together and then take it off to the various uses. Pretty interesting. Um, okay, whoop, 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 whoop. Oh, now what have I done? Cancel. Oof. All right, so here's our boiler efficiency, you know, and that'll be something we'll learn how to do based on uh, stack loss measurements and other estimations. So you come up with a boiler efficiency. Blowdown rate of the, on a mass basis of the, um, the mass of the feed water entering the boiler, what percent gets thrown out as blowdown? Uh, is the boiler down flashed? Is it taken to a flash tank and the flash steam recovered and kept in the system, or do we just throw it all away? And then say when that, when that high temperature, high pressure water hits the, hits 
you know, wherever you drain it out, you get out, you get flash steam. I mean, you put three, four, five hundred degree water out on the ground. Yeah, you get a bunch of flash steam out of it. Are you throwing that away, or are you going to use it for something? Um, there is an option here to uh, preheat the makeup water. Take that liquid, take that liquid blow down after it flashes. Put it through a heat exchanger and preheat your makeup water before it goes in the boiler. So instead of 80 degrees, maybe you could put it in the system at 120. And that's just less fuel that has to go in the boiler because you're keeping more energy in it. Uh, what's your steam temperature? Deaerator vent rate. That deaerator that's driving off that oxygen and non-condensable gases from the steam, the way it does that, it sprays some steam out inside the device and it scrubs all those gases out of the, the, the feed water and the makeup water. And you have to vent, you have to vent that. And so there is a vent of steam. You see a little steam plume. You see a, typically a little pipe, it might be one inch coming up the top of the boiler house. And you see this little, some kind of a plume of steam coming out. Some plants, was this plant in China, this one plant, we asked to see the, we went up to see the DA, we climbed up on this thing and said, well, where's the vent? And of course, had an interpreter and the guy points at this pipe and you look up at the pipe and there's nothing coming out, nothing. And I went, oh my, this isn't good. And then we, we came down and we explained that, well, it's supposed to vent a little bit. And then I asked him, do you have any corrosion problems? Pitting and oxygen pitting. And he goes, oh yes, yes. We went out back and they had all these valves laying around and pieces of pipe that had oxygen pits all over the place. You go, ah, this is starting to add up, you know, you're, you, you're not letting the oxygen out of your system up there on top. Well, then it was down in Louisiana at this place and look, looked up at the, the DA vent and there's this cloud of steam bigger than Brown Hall up there. I go, oh no, that's way too much, you know? You, they say the rule of thumb is you're supposed to be able to see that plume like, I don't know, two to 10 feet or something like that. And it's not supposed to be just, you know, trying to drain all the steam out of the system. It's supposed to be fairly lazy, you know? So there, there actually, there's a certification that you can earn in steam plume deaerator estimation. There's actually, they, they teach courses in it. I mean, it's a short course kind of thing. They take you out and they show you pictures and take you out in the field, show you what it ought to look like and then examples of what it shouldn't look like. I've never done it, but I know there is a certification for it. Uh, and deaerator pressure. The steam that goes to that deaerator, what's the pressure? It's typically five to 15 pounds, someplace in that range. Okay, so that's boiler. Header, okay, so now you know what headers are. And so you can put in this, this is we're running a two header system. You can do, well, it's not, it's not gonna let me change it at this point. When you start out, you can run one, two or three headers. So, you know, if one header, you just have one boiler pressure. Two headers, high pressure, low pressure, three headers, high, medium, low. That's the max you get for free on this tool. Uh, so we've got two high pressure header, well, 150 PSIG. What's the process steam use? So out of that header, how much steam are you using for a process, for like in heat exchangers or whatever it is you're producing? Um, so in this plant, we estimated, and this is this is thousand pounds per hour. So that's k pounds per hour. Note the end. Uh, condensate recovery. So of that steam that goes out in that header, what percent comes back as condensate? So they said 60%. So we're losing 40% someplace. Steam leaks, blowing traps, dumping it on the ground, leaks, who knows? But see, when you, when, when you work in the, in the boiler house, you, you have a pretty good idea how much your makeup water is because you have to buy chemicals. 
and the, so the chemical company, they know the bleed rates and all that stuff. So by the amount of chemical that you use, they can tell you pretty accurately how much makeup water you're bringing into the system. Well, if you got steam flow meters, you know what's going out, you know what's, what, what's not coming back, so then you know your percent pretty well. So that's usually a pretty, a pretty easy number to get. Uh, the condensate that come, does come back, what temperature is it? If it comes back at 220 and you put it in an atmospheric pressure tank, what's gonna happen? It's gonna flash. Because at, at standard atmospheric pressure, 14.7, what, it boils at 212. So if it's 220 and I dump it in at atmospheric pressure, I'm gonna get some flash steam up. So just looking at that, I'm sitting there going, there might be an opportunity there to, to capture that flash steam and do something with it. Uh, where am I? Uh, 220. Uh, flash, the condensate return, or do, do we already have a flash tank? You can say yes. Um, heat loss. Just an estimate from the header, that's a tenth of a percent. You know, you can, you, you can mess with that. Now, I, I typically don't, but you can. Or you could do, if you want to do a heat loss number, you can go out and you can survey the pipe and count the lengths and diameters, shoot it with an IR camera or a temperature gun and do a, an offline calculation. And then you could put numbers in here if you wanted to, you sure could. And then the same type of information on the low pressure header. Uh, okay, and that last question down there is desuperheat steam out of the high pressure header. So that's the spray. That's where it's asking you, are you spraying coming out of the PRV? Because when you drop pressure, if you're saturated coming in, you're gonna be superheated coming out a little bit. And are you spraying water in there? And so all you gotta do is turn that on and it'll ask you some questions and then you put that in the model. So that's what that's talking about. And then the last, which they didn't have anything, we could put a couple of turbines in this thing. We could put a condensing turbine from high pressure to a condenser or we could put a turbine to run between the high pressure and low pressure headers. So let's look at a diagram here. So you just click the diagram and that's, that's what we have built pretty quickly. And so, guys, and then, so you can click on, you can highlight and you get something, you can click on the boiler and you get boiler properties, um, process usage, Deaerator, click on that. It gives you information about the deaerator operation. Uh, let's see. So back to generation summary. So what we see is we've told it that we've got uh, 14,400 pounds an hour of process use here. And I put this header, I put this second header in in order to feed the deaerator. I don't have to do that, but if I want to put in a flash tank or something like that, you have to, you have to put in this low pressure header. That was my complaint to Oak Ridge, that you have to use up a header in order to be able to um, so like flash blow down or, or flash this condensate and put that flash into the deaerator, which is a pretty common project. But uh, anyway, so we've got what? We've got 107 pounds per hour coming into the deaerator. And so that's, that's pretty much, that's 101. And then uh, let's see, here's my blowdown. This is my blowdown line. So what is that? Uh, 240. 0.24 K pounds or 240 pounds per hour. And that's going to sewer. Here's my makeup water. I'm bringing in 12.2 um, gallons per minute or what's that, 6,000 pounds an hour. It's coming in. 
Here's my 220 condensate coming back. They mix, and so I've got, um, what, 1,464,000 1, pounds an hour. Let me see now, how am I? And I've got steam coming in here, and then this is what I have coming out. Feed water, this is my stack loss. So I've got lots of stuff up here. How are we doing? Oh, we're, we're fine. Okay. Um, you can click on report. And see, I've run, I've run some projects here that are showing up. So I see my, my baseline, and if I go back to diagram, I, it'll repeat some of these. So steam generated, total operating cost, uh, $1,550,000. Boiler fuel use, boiler fuel cost. Um, I'm not, gen I don't have any turbines. I'm not generating anything. We told it the plant load was 1500 KW. And so that just multiplies out to a little over a million dollars a year in electrical cost. And here's my makeup water. Okay. If I go to, I get out of it. go to report. Then, so we put a flash tank in, so I can show you what that looks like. You go over here. And let's see, so here's the flash tank. So let's see. So we're putting, yeah, okay. So this is a blowdown flash. So we're taking this uh, 240 pounds an hour and we're putting it into this flash tank and we're taking that flash steam into the low pressure header, which then can go into the deaerator and see my steam production goes down a little bit from 15,670, that's what it is. It was 15,700. So it's not, not a tremendous impact, but nonetheless, you know, that's what we simulated. And then I took the flash tank out and I put a heat exchanger in. So now I've got this, uh, 230 pounds per hour of blowdown uh, coming, uh, let's see, it, it's coming into this heat exchanger. And so my water, instead of going to the DA at 80, is going at 91.17. And so that backs off of my DA steam. And so now my steam production is 15,640 pounds per hour. And then, just for the heck of it, I put them both in. So there's the flash tank and the heat exchanger. And so, you know, you can evaluate this stuff. Uh, let's see, report. Um, so that was the summary. Annual savings, pretty small. Probably not enough to do any of this, but anyway, this, it's not a big system. Energy summary. You get uh, all the different energy numbers. Electricity doesn't change. Um, steam cost. Well, we can see the makeup water gallons per, was that GPM, gallons per year, and all that sort of thing. Fuel cost. Losses. Calculate losses, diagram, graphs, input summary. You know look at what you've told it on all this stuff. So anyway, um, that's enough for this right now. But very soon, uh, I'm going to give you an assignment. We're, we'll have some assignments where you guys will do them in, uh, in measure and then, uh, you know, cut and paste and you can copy stuff out of this, Excel stuff, and then uh, give me a little report with your findings. So measure is pretty cool. And it's, it's got all kinds of stuff. It, it also has... Uh, let's see, if you go back home here, it has all these little calculators. So like steam system calculators, you can do uh, steam properties, saturation properties, stack loss calculator, heat loss, boiler, flash tank. So look, you got all this stuff that you can look at as well. And those are just do little fairly simple calculations, maybe an energy balance around one component or something like that. 
we'll look at some of those as we go forward here. Okay, and we've got some other software that I'll be demoing for you. Okay, so this is getting into your reading now a little bit. So we've got two types of uh, boilers. We got our uh, fire tube and water tube, and these are just kind of cartoons of them. But a fire tube is like this guy on this side, on the left. So the burner inserts into this and fires down this larger tube. And so these hot combustion gases come down and they hit the end of this thing and it's divided into sections. So this end cap is feeding those gases through these two tubes and they come back around here and then this end cap feeds them back through these tubes and it goes out. So we would call this a one, two, three pass boiler. They have one pass, two pass, three pass, four pass. The more passes, the more efficiency you're gonna get because you got more heat transfer surface. You also have to pay more money for it, you know? So it's kind of like, did you buy, did you buy a, 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 a four cylinder engine and you're trying to drive it you know, 120 miles an hour, or did you buy the eight? Did you buy the eight with some get up and go? You know, what you know, what kind of efficiency, what kind of performance you're going to get? A lot of it depends on what did you buy. The uh, water tube boiler over here has a combustion zone, has burners, can be in the corners or on the side wall. Blast out into here. You got a fireball. And the surface of this combustion zone is lined with tubes and you've got tube surfaces all around and the water is inside the tubes. And so the heat goes into the tubes and you generate steam inside those tubes. It then rises up to the steam drum uh, and then the steam gets separated. And this is showing a little bit of, this, this would be superheater tubing through here where we can actually do some superheat and then on out to the system. Some industrial boilers have you know, some superheat capability and others don't. It just depends what they bought. So on the fire tube, uh, we typically say about 300 pounds is maximum. Uh, typical steam flow rate, uh, yeah, this needs to get modified. Tech has a two, okay, BHP is boiler horsepower. Okay, boiler horsepower times 34.5 is pounds per hour. You need to memorize that unit. 34 and a half is a nominal conversion. So if I have a, what, a one, say, say I've got a thousand boiler horsepower boiler, the rated steam production is 34,500. Tech has a 2,000. I've changed this number, I've got multiple versions of this. The largest they make now is 2,500 that I'm aware of. So the, the largest brake horsepower, or I'm sorry, boiler horsepower is, I know Cleaver Brooks makes a 2,500 times 34.5. So that's 86,250. So tex is 2,000. So it's at 34.5 times two, that's yeah, 69,000 pounds an hour on tex new, new boiler over there. Uh, these are gonna be saturated steam. There's just no real way to incorporate uh, superheaters in this thing. Uh, the shell loss is an inherent advantage because if you look down here at the bottom of this thing, you see the water, see the, the hottest surfaces, the, the hottest thing is the combustion gas is going through the tubes, but they're surrounded by water, which is basically the saturation temperature because the steam is being generated on the outside of those tubes. Well, so the hottest temperature this shell sees is the saturation temperature, you know? And so 
you know, that might be three, 400 degrees. Well, in this boiler, we've got 3,000 degree gases upside the fire brick that is driving heat out of this thing. So we say that uh, the, an inherent uh, efficiency advantage over a water tube is a, a, a lower shell loss. And it's because of the temperature, this water is far less than the temperature of combustion gases. And that's what's sitting right up against the shell. So that's an inherent advantage of a fire tube boiler over a water tube boiler. Uh, that's a more realistic depiction of what you see. I think that's a Scotch Marine boiler. But uh, you got a fan, you got your burner here, gas and air is being blown down through this uh, large tube where combustion is occurring and then the gas is passed back and forth. And that's when it's coming out this end. So this is one, uh, I don't know, two, three, it's probably a four pass. We've got uh, safety controls. Um, you've got a flame. You can look at the both ends of these things and look in. You've got a little observation port. You can, you can actually see the flame, see the burner. Controls up here. These doors hinge and open on the front and back so you can clean tubes that sort of thing. This is uh, where the blowdown comes out. It'll have a tube that comes out on the side and then it'll have a tube that comes out on the bottom. So you can pull water from right off of the water level or you can pull it off the bottom. Okay, I'd say that's, uh, we'll, uh, we'll stop there. And uh, so the first 30 minutes of Tuesday's class will be that quiz and then we'll go ahead and discuss continuing this for the remainder party. Thank you. Mm -hmm.